production, please record these two singing so I can play it later. Nope. Hello there. Welcome back to Worlds 2022. The players on your screen right now are in what could be their final game of the 2022 World Championship. Let's start by talking about what DFM has done wrong in game three that I would like to see them change in game four. Because what I want to start with is in game one, they clearly won the game. They were the better team. Game two, they won the early game. But this tower dive is going to give me nightmares. Yeah, and it feels like the biggest change from detonation focused me from the first two games to this game, which is them really overforcing in impossible dives. Where this one, I didn't really see it. Even if the, uh, even if Way was not there to yeah. protect it, yeah, I thought yeah. it was just going to be difficult. And then a lot of the fights that were being picked, I thought were just really a stretch. And I think especially since your main ticket in this game is that split push threat from Trinomir, and then later on in team fights, you have Trinomir and Yumi, you do want to play a lot more slower. And I felt like they tried to speed the pace of the game up. And I, I talked about this a little bit before the break as well, but I, I, I want to reiterate, oh. I think RNG makes it very, very tough to not try and force. Uh, but at the same time, moments like this where Insane. you're losing, you're, you've already lost the mid play and you're trying to kind of recuperate, you throw a lot of cooldowns at them and Gala and Ming still just walk it off. It was ridiculous that Ming stepped back yeah. into the Sedge Alt to tank it for Gala. Yep. That boomerang blade was what, one pixel away Insane. from landing? I mean, th those small differences in game two, um, Breeze Aatrox was kind of what turned the game around, right? Yeah. He, he survived by the skin of his teeth a number of times. Um, Dead of Detonation focused me, we're not able to not only pick those kills up, but then press that advantage further. Yeah. Where I'm sitting in my head right now is that RNG are now they have something to prove. That game three to me is like, okay, we're now firing all cylinders game one and two. One could argue they were a little bit slow to get their hands warm yeah. and DFM took advantage. Now for DFM to make me eat those words and shut up, they need to show up now in game four. I'm gonna ask you guys, how does that work? How do you see DFM winning this game? So I've kind of spoiled it, sadly, <laughs> which is just back to discipline play. A lot of it is not just, even though I think the draft really helped them, it's not just that. I felt like they legitimately played better split side map when it felt like it was needed and had an even game, not taking absurd fights for a very long time up until like the 20 minute mark in the previous ones. Play towards that. Don't be overforcing like we saw in the first do, series of the day. Do you believe they have the patience and the ability in the 15 minutes it's been since they lost the game to be able to change the mentality and the approach? I, I know they can. This team has shown, uh, I think, both uh, domestically and even on the international stage that they can pull it together in best of fives. I think against RNG specifically, it's so hard because uh, by default, they're a team that really forces you to do something or they'll win. They'll find an angle. And that's why for me, I want to go back to game one in a mm. different way. I want a better mid jungle 2v2. The Maokai you're obviously not getting anymore, but that combination of the Maokai plus the Yone was actually enough to keep Zhao Hu uh, locked and Wei just didn't have a great game. That to me is the core combination because trying to focus on Brief, I don't think it works. Even if he doesn't get Aatrox, I think Brief is really good at absorbing the pressure. Um, Gala and Ming have been growing throughout the series as well. So trying to make sure that Yaharong and Steel can actually keep those two down keeps RNG from really getting their groove on early on. But I would really like that Aatrox ban or pick. <laughs> like, yeah, because, uh, it'd be wanted. Yeah, on blue side. Because they've, exactly. And they've been doing such a good job making picks on sides. So when the Aatrox has been keeping himself alive long enough for the yeah. full rotation of the team, it's like, that's just annoying. Take that out of the game. I'm gonna try something and this might not work, but we are done, we're about to head to Champion Select. And in order for Detonation Focus Me to go to game five, to get one step closer to New York, they're playing Aatrox here! They're playing Aatrox <laughs> here! <laughs> that means go, go to Casters, thank oh, you. No. <laughs> 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 All right, apparently that does mean go to us. Okay, Welcome back. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. It's game number four between RNG and DFM. If for some reason you're just now joining us, well, hey, DFM surprised everybody by taking the first game, and then RNG has just done nothing but continue to find their groove since then. Yeah, RNG, they're never a team you count out. There's a lot of teams in the LPL you can look at as people who, if, if they fall behind, could lose a series. RNG able to hold it together. DFM, though, now going to be looking to bounce back. 
I'm going to be looking at the bot lane. I'm going to be looking at Utapon. He's been the long-standing member. He's been on DFM since the very start. Coming 2013, going into LGL in 2014, has been to all the international appearances they've made. And it feels like to me, he has to be the one to show that veteran seed step up. I was still in college in 2013, man. That's... Oh, it was a long time. Like, this is this is some ancient history. I was at a J Wood in San Diego. It was a long, long time. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, let's see what we get out of the draft here in this one. For the first time this series, DFM will be on blue side. Graves and Silas band away. That Graves ban stays banned. While RNG is saying no more tree, no more cannon. Still sticking with the Calista ban though, which is a bit of a surprise. Again, I thought we'd see this dropped, but uh, this is going to be the first time that we actually get RNG on the red side. We're still seeing them stick with Maokai. We're going to get the Kennen. I'm curious what that next one is going to be. We saw in the last one was still the One, which could honestly be it, but it feels like Evie now has that opportunity to take away the Aatrox regardless, and then we'll have to see how Breathe feels playing into it. Could actually bring out the Fiora that we've seen banned away a little bit throughout yeah, the series. Fiora, which has been banned away. He's been going with the Jacks into it so far. I think RNG are one of the teams who I expect to be very comfortable playing into the Aatrox just because of the champion pool that Breathe has. Still, it would be the first pick I would expect to see because other picks that have been high presence in planes like Hecarim have kind of been falling through the wayside so far in this draft. That was the other one I wasn't sure on. If they want to take away the Sejuani, Steel has been eyeing that up consistently. Now, I think Wade didn't have the best of games on in game one, so maybe they were going to let it through, but it feels like now Breathe just gets to go back towards the, the Aatrox. You can look towards the Viego again for Wade if you want, and essentially just, even though we're flipping Side, stick with the same picks. Yeah, it's kind of strange if you end up getting the just walk it back on opposite sides, you're kind of wondering, well, what's going on here? Yeah, that, that's actually why I'm not the biggest fan of the Sejuani coming through. Like, I totally get it. It's comfort for Steel. He's looked great on it so far throughout plans, but it's one of the things that opens up Way's Viego, and Way does look like one of the members of RNG who hasn't fully adapted so far to the meta that we have here uh, at Worlds. Oh, no. And now he's going to be able to keep going oh, no. towards it, but that guy. Oh, no. I don't think either of us want to see this. <laughs> the, the, show who has a 33% win rate on his ear. We it did is not the pick. We got away. We got away. We got away. We got away. We took a different route. Lissandra locked in for RNG and Xiaohu. And this this is a combo, right? Yeah. I mean, you go in, you have Reset City coming through, Viego able to, you know, get control of another champion, and then the Ice Zombies able to follow up and find those kills. But one of the difference from last game is this time around, things like the Yone still left open, but this is much more stock and standard DFM playing that discipline style that Raz was talking about. And that's about. what I was going to say, right? This is definitely a composition now that we're starting to write out that is like, hey, we're going to play for late game. We're going to play for these later fights. We're not going to try and go for any of these wacky dives in the early stages. And it is again going to fall back to RNG to play this more aggressive style. So I think taking something like a Tristana here in this bottom side could also play into that, give yourself a ton of the range. Yes. And it looks like that is going to be the game plan here for DM. I, I love it. I love it coming out so far for DFM. They're not only taking away some things that RNG have liked and leaned on, but also going back to their style. The thing that's scary is what we were talking about, you know, when we finished last game about RNG, they've kind of accepted like, hey, you know, if the FM can match us mid and late, let's just get ahead early and picks like the Azir open up for that. Oh, he could be getting it though. Breathe, eyeing up the Fiora. I still think he'll probably take the, oh, I was going to say take the Aatrox. Yes. This, this is going to be it. And this is something everybody that I talked to was like, yeah, but you won't blind pick the Fiora. They're never going to, this is what we do in LPL. We are happy to blind the Fiora and just go run amok in the top side. This is how Breathe became came famous back when his name was Curse and he was playing on OMG, had an insane Fiora outplay, and then everyone in the LPL was watching him. LPL blind Fiora locked in here in game number four. And hey, if you're willing to blind lock Fiora, you don't have to worry about banning Aatrox because people pick Fiora into Aatrox anyway. So they're essentially daring DFM to take the pick as Rel and Nautilus will both be banned away. They want to target engage supports. Over on the other side, DFM knows they have a marksman, their opponents don't, so they'll ban out of Felios, but they'll throw in another engage support ban of their own, Moving a Moomoo -moo as RNG pick up Varus for Gala. Yes, we actually saw Unforgiven pick this up the other day. It is something that's still kind of on the outskirts of the meta and does have a decent amount of push, can set up well for team fights as well, and just have good follow up on the likes of the lockup from the Lissandra. So, still, you're going to have a strong enough 4v4 coming through from RNG. Decent scaling with the Varus, but I still think a lot of this is going to be predicated on hey, let's get Breathe ahead in this top side and make sure this VR can pop off. 
Yeah, and it looks like for Evi, just gonna go back to something safe and standard. Gonna lock in the Nar, so should have a decent time up in top side. At least you have the range you can try and get through that matchup. And DFM, I mean, they've completely signaled, right? They are playing four 5v5s. You don't expect to see any early shenanigans coming out from them and trying to match into what RNG have done so far and probably looking to pick up another, you know, engaged source in the bot side. Yeah, Leona, that was the, the, the big one I was gonna say, especially when you're looking towards the virus on that bot side as well. Having the solar flare, short range yep. AD carry, Leona just suits super well and you've got great all in. So now I'm curious to see what Ming is actually gonna go with on this bot side and um, could end up going back towards, honestly, someone like the Tam Kench. Yeah. Like, I think that's gonna be your best bet to just try and keep people safe. I mean, whenever you see somebody like Varus or like Aphelios or any of these AD carries that do not have built-in defensive mechanisms, Tom Kench is just one of their best buddies in the whole entire world, right? He can keep you safe, he can keep you protected, he can get you away from those solar flares, from those Sejuani ultimates, from those Mega Nars, and get him to a spot where he can deal the damage. Yeah, and I, I now for RNG, I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind, right, is wanting to play through sides with the fact that they have that Fiora, also not having a huge front line, so team fights can be a little bit dicey. But even when they ever want to start any of their own action, like go on a turn, or maybe you found a pick and now you want to force, a lot going to be on the plate of Xiaohu. Um, but that's the way they played coming into summer, right? When we saw the meta kind of shift away from engaged supports, Xiaohu was the one that stepped up and took that mantle on pick specifically like the Lissandra. So I'm expecting big things again from Xiaohu to be able to try and play that style and We'll have to see exactly how RNG are going to try and play it this early game because it feels like, again, they need to get these leads or you just fall victim to the team fight of DFS. And you know, guys, I've been on the desk with, with Jat every day. And Jat's been making a lot of references to, like, obscure sandwiches, peanut butter and bacon, which sounds fine to me or other things. To me, though, Jat, if you're out there, DFM have the PBJ. This is, like, the most standard, you know, 5v5 team fight comp. You have a solid front line. You have a ton of DPS. You don't expect a lot to happen early on in the game. If it does, maybe I'd expect happen more around bot side because you do have Tristana, so you do have some all-in threat there, but it seems like DFM have just covered their bases overall with their composition. So do we feel like we're going to get more of a game one type of early game, no first blood till 10 minutes type of play, or what's the what's the expectation here with these compositions? I think it's really hard to say, because I the biggest problem that I see is that like a lot of this is going to hinge on like Xiaohu and Wei trying to work together again, um, but very similar to game one, it's going to be hard for him to get out of lane. Like Azir gets a ton of priority against Lissandra, very hard for Lissandra to actually get access to those sides. So I think it will be a case of DFM having that time to get to a mid game where they're happier to fight and just having Unipon continuously pushing bot lane, Yaron continuously pushing mid and just trying to play through the, uh, the push you have across all three of your lanes. All righty, let's rock and roll, let's do it. We've got RNG with teleport on both of their solo laners here in this one, so that they know that they're ready to go here and answer whatever might be going on across the map. Also, Spellbook there for Lissandra, nothing too wild. Showing up across the loadouts for anybody, both AD carry is gonna be rocking the cleanse here in this one because of the amount of CC, especially point and click type of CC yeah. available on both sides. And you know, the thing I'm looking at now is I feel like RNG are gonna have to put a lot into playing around top side. The fact that Brady didn't take the flash for DFM, they now have a point to pressure up in top as well. Like you said, Steel gonna have the CC to come through. Hart might be able to find some movements as well because not a ton of threat coming down in bot lane is Breathe. Not gonna feel too threatened early on, but still a nice trade for DFM. Yep. Just gonna get a little bit of HP off him up there, but it's not like either top laner really had to do a whole lot of anything. No summoner spells used, no potions consumed. Both of them lose about 100 HP, but nobody's too worried about it. Doesn't look like we'll get a whole lot different from what we've been seeing so far here at the level ones. A little bit of poking, a little bit of annoyance back and forth, but no real all-in type of moves coming out. Breathe is still just hanging around, seeing if maybe he can get one extra bit of damage, but it won't happen. I mean, it's it's not like he's going to be able to do too much in this top side anyway. Evie should have control there just with the, the range advantage. We'll have to just try and play it back from Breathe, although Breathe trying to see if you could do a little bit to zone him off. But again, you should have just push across all three lanes here, working relatively well for DFM. And then I think that's how you can open up the map for Steel and see if he can get some work done. Yeah, and you know, that's why we don't expect to see too much action able to come through early on in the game. Definitely some setup there. You talked about especially for Xiaohu having that CC to set up for four way. The problem is Yaharan on the Azir has the mobility to get away. And then when we look at Steel, uh, we talked about no flash on Breathe, but pathing down towards that bottom side first. Though, so we might get the, the workings of the mid jungle. 
Ooh, we could get a nice spicy bit of early gameplay here, or we could get some some smoke and Azir standing still. Yep, it's gonna be about uh, a little bit of damage there from Wei, enough to deal a an, an HP will, potions worth of damage. I will give the spice level of that play, we'll say a spice like cumin. Yeah, that was not a whole lot, but now maybe they're able to spice it up. Flash into the stun. Over the wall goes Yaharong. Xiao Hu's here with a follow. They don't have enough damage. That was wacky. He did so well to respect the first game. Gank walks right up. I mean, Wei was waiting around, but still didn't have enough time to get like halfway through River, even if he wanted to. Yeah, really weird that they end up committing that much to mid lane as well, because they ended up losing a lot of the pressure now that they could follow up with that flash being burnt on Yaharong. Looks like they are going to move immediately towards the top side, though. We might be looking for a, guy, for a dive on both sides. Oh boy, my friends. Here we go. Top side, it's heavy in danger. There comes your Spectral Maw. Won't hit, won't matter. First blood of the breathe. Nothing to it. And that was just a solo kill coming through as well. We didn't have anything else happening, but now die for DFM. Yep, they're bringing it in, but is it going to be enough? Utapone going for it. He tries to cleanse, but he dies before his butt hits the ground. Oh, we man. It slow. Raz wanted it slow. Where's the slow? Did they Everyone... read Raz's win condition? Are they razzing right now? <laughs> they might be razzing, man. That was not, 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 not what DFM needed. And you can understand, right? RNG setting up the play on the opposite side of the map. They feel like they want to get something going for themselves as well. But now it feels like two games in a row, a, a die from DFM only coming to set them behind. RNG now gets the wave pushed in. Doesn't seem like Utapon will lose out on too much, but still nice advantage going for Honestly, RNG on both sides of the map. And that's the thing. I mean, look, you do win on top side for RNG, which is why I think DFM felt the need to make that play, but you really didn't have to. I mean, Utapon was going to be able to slowly chip away at these turrets. He would have gotten those plates. You actually could have then tried to play up to Tristana after she got a Vanjie. I mean, look, Utapon's about to get one for himself here, right? But Ming does a good job of baiting DFM underneath the tower. Knows he has the flash, knows he's got that thick skin. The TP can come through from Xiaohu as well, and Utapon just not quite able to finish him off before they go down. And even the fact that Leona had to flash away from the turret as well to keep herself safe says a lot about how that went. It was a split second before he hits the ground and gets the rocket jump damage. And I actually think what might have determined it is the fact that the way the turret was shooting, he's up in the air right next to the crystal that fires the bullet. Yeah. <laughs> it had to travel all of about two centimeters before it hits him and kills him. And it just feels bad for Utapone, man. The unforced errors are the ones that can sting the most in a game of League of Legends, particularly a game like this, where it's all on the line for DFM. Yeah, I mean, it's an exciting game. And it's kind of sadly for DFM that they've been here before. They had to play against EDG to get out of play-ins in 2018. Not something you want to do having to play an LPL no. to decide if you get to the main stage. Back then, they got 3-0'd, so, you know, they have stepped up, taking a game off RNG again, another close game too, and this game's still not over just yet. Okay, Harp's gonna get punished here, maybe nice job popping the blast plant. They need a bit more damage to finish him off here. They're gonna grab the kill. DFM getting punished. RNG just stopping him again. Yeah, they're crashing and burning a little bit here, lads. DFM not able to find anything on that play. 4-0 and now for RNG, and I mean, last year was the first time DFM managed to make it to that world's group stage. And unfortunately, it looks like the ship might have sailed with the way that this game is going. Man, Wei is already onto the Drake now, too. Remember back to game one when DFM got it at seven minutes? I said, wow, that's a really fast Drake, boys. Well, it's going to be even faster here this time around. And it's paired up ever so nicely, complemented by a 2000. Yeah, and it's nice to see. It's nice to see Wei having a really good series. Honestly, great, great play-ins, great playoffs in LPL because he didn't feel like he had the best regular season under his belt. And he's one of the main driving factors for RNG. We're going to see here, DFM wanting to go for this invade and try and find a bit of a punish coming out. But three members of RNG are already here. Utapon tries to join up, but Harp is already so low. Feels like everything goes the way of RNG. I even love how aggressively Gala played the flashing in, knowing no real follow-up can come from anyone on DFM. Well, that's because you're looking at Utapod and he's kind of there for emotional support. Yeah. Like, you know, you got it, guys. Go <laughs> for it, guys. Fellas. Like, oh, okay. Well, that one didn't work out so hot. But now Ming going to be able to move in towards mid lane, going to help out Xiao, who we're looking at the Rift Herald that's just about to spawn in 45 seconds. And it's just RNG trying to see if they can get control for that with Gala already starting to get that push in bot side so they can set up for it. 
Yeah, they've already got way with control over the Scuttle Crab. Utapone just walking right back down into the bottom lane to be ready to farm up. So AD carries both left on their lonesome down here as Wei will head back into his own side of the jungle. All of our solo laners have their level six. They have their ultimates. Of course, Evie's was just spent up there. We know how easily Gnar likes to expend that. Just use it on the wave, if nothing else. The cooldown is very short. However, the jungler is still both level five for now. I do expect particularly for Wei, and there it is, right as I say it. Level six hit for both of them. So the ultis are available if we get a Herald fight. Yeah, I'm curious to see if RNG outright start the Herald or if they try to find a play on Evie first. Luckily, Evie hasn't walked and shown in lane yet because it could have been very easy CC setup coming through. We'll just check it out. Now we see what DFM wants to do because Steel going to start heading up here. And I mean, DFM do have solid AOE tools to be able to try to pick one member of RNG off. But RNG did see the enemy top laner on that control ward that they placed in the top part of the jungle. So they are aware of Evie's movements. He's back underneath the turret, answering a massive wave right now. And DFM, they know that they cannot afford to go try and stop that as Breathe just backs away a little bit, takes a turret shot, no big deal really. It's Rift Herald over to the side of RNG. Yeah, able to use that top pride to make sure no one comes in. I also meant CC tools to, you know, pick oh, a member see. off, as you know, that is what CC does. But sadly for DFM, <laughs> very important. A, yes. Yeah. You know, we're here teaching the fundamentals, what people <laughs> want to know. But DFM, not able to go for any sort of cross map. And it's just kind of rough, right? Already being in this position so early on in the game that it really doesn't feel like. Like, their draft didn't have the tools to really set anything up regardless, but now already starting to fall into this much of a hole at the 10 minute mark feels rough. Yeah, and I mean, because he got Braid with this big CS lead in the top side, he's actually going to be uh, very quickly escalating to a point where Evie just can't really deal with them. Shehu, yes, is falling behind in the mid lane, but again, it's not really a, the end of the world if your Lissandra doesn't have the, the same CS. She's going to be just doing her job regardless. Alrighty, we've got a 3v3 maybe brewing down here in bottom lane. DFM, I'm sure we're thinking about it, especially with Harp hitting six and Ming not doing the same, but they see Wei shadowing behind. They know if they go in, they're just going straight home in a body bag. They call it off. And I'm glad they did because you just can't force things like that so hard. Xiaohu trying to make the rotation up towards top side, walks over some vision so Evie should know enough to get away in time. Yeah, and the fact that we can see him about to Meg as well. Breed's already been chunked out a little bit. I like they don't go for that. There it is. They're going to blow up Ming, or are they? No way he gets out of this one. He uses the stasis. Unipone dies, and DFM's hopes are going with them. Wei wants to grab another one. The piercing arrow right through Steel's heart. The reset champion into the reset champion. That should be illegal. The amount of distance he got to carry this to finish off these members and Wei we're still go going! Oh no, it's a disaster! Wei gets kill number seven for RNG. This game is a slaughter. If you have young children watching, tell them to avert their eyes because this is some violence on the rift from RNG. RNG just scaling up into the series. The most dominant early game they've had so far. Dagged. I'll even take this one, but like you said, way getting from where he starts to where he ends is crazy. And the fact that Ming gets away. Like, I don't even see a health bar there. He's just shield. And then as Unipon goes in, he end up seeing the stopwatch come through perfectly. And this is, this is the reset champion into the reset, into the follow-up, and then it's ah, just get it off my screen. <laughs> It's, it took him like five seconds to get from where he started yeah. to, to where he ended. So yeah, Wei, once again, 3 0 2 on the Viego. Oh no. Oh no. Harp. Harp. Oh no, they're just going to spit him right back out. Gobble, 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 gobble. Gobble, 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 gobble. They, they, they're just screwing around. They're having a good time. <laughs> There's three right. wards invested on the blast Wait. mode to stop Harp All right, there we go. Away. There we go. 8 to 0. RNG is just having fun with it at this point. Breathe, nice repose, nice dodge. This is why you can blind pick Fiora. Breathe just goes right back in. He wants to box with them a little bit. I love Breathe just playing right in front of them the whole time, just baiting their attention. Maybe trying to get Steel to overstay, but DFM knowing they have no opportunities. I feel like that level of swagger and daring is exactly, who, whoever designed Fiora, get Fiora's champ designer on the phone. I want to hear, like, this has to be what they were envisioning for playing with your opponents and dancing around them as he does it again, again and again. 
again and again and again and again. And now Yaharong trying to get himself away, but it ain't gonna work too well. Or is it? Harp going into block Xiao Hu. As Yaharong, there it is. Spectral Maw flies out, Wei flies in. And boy, oh boy, RNG pick up the first turret to go with it. It's 6K in 12 minutes. The turret goes down, but you've already got two dragons for RNG, and we're only 13 minutes into the game. This is the level that RNG were expected to come in at, and finally, they're showing their true colors in this series. Now, Breathe gonna start putting pressure onto this top lane turret as well, picking up at least one, of, if not two of these fights before the turret fights phase. Yeah, looks like DFM, though, gonna try and right. find the pick. Can they do it the third time? Okay, this time, they brought three dudes. Can Breathe escape all three of them? He goes back in. He reposts a whole hell of a lot of CC, but he's got very little mana left to work with. He tries the lunge yet again, and finally, through hell and high water, <laughs> they come for him again and again, and they get their man, DFM, are on the board. DFM finally have something to show for. Still not in the best of places, and now I'm hoping, you know, maybe Ming will scold him. You know, earlier we were talking about how Xiaohu and Ming are the mom and dad. They've said Xiaohu is like the, uh, the supportive, emotional, let's go, guys, and Ming is the one who, you know, brings down the fist yeah. when uh, anyone steps out of line. I imagine that's what happened after game one as well. You would have to think something like that, right? One's the parent that's happy you got an A, the <laughs> other's the parent that says, well, you know, 96 is all right, but what about the other four? Exactly. So RNG. <laughs> I, think the list, I say it because I say it because my mom was like that growing up. Love you, mom, but we both know it was true. Let's see. Can Evie get away from this one? Yep, he's good. Oh. He's good. DF, you take those. In both, a game like this, you take those. Both top laners showing their experience in dodgeball. I love it. I love it. But RNG still being the ones to keep pressure top side. Surprised that they aren't going to overcommit. But I guess no one from DFM really showing on the map. We can see uh, Yaharong right now picking up Krugs. Harp not even walking out from base yet, so not wanting to overcommit for that objective. Yeah, taking a slow across the map. I mean, you're going to get the Rift Herald here anyway, so they're pretty happy to just take the objective and leave. Uh, Breathe should be fine now to start moving down towards this bottom side. Xiaohu will be able to put pressure on towards that top tower and have a little bit of that escape with the Ice Claw to keep himself in check. So overall, again, RNG just kind of dot their eyes and cross their T's, make sure that they're able to get all these outer turrets down. And this has kind of always been the way with RNG is they'll get these leads and it's this slow, steady suffocation that just is horrible to be on the receiving end. <laughs> I don't feel like any sort of uh, suffocation in the game of League of Legends is what you want to be a part of on the receiving end here for DFM. But man, it's been so tough here in this game. Utapone especially, if this man's not completely tilted out of his mind, then he has absolute just like Asgard mental. I, I'm just saying, like, how could you... I'm still tilted for him from last game's boomerang blade that, that didn't get the kill. <laughs> I will say, though, to give DFM their due, they performed incredibly in game one and game two of this yeah. series. Like game one, they took the game. Game two was incredibly close and they pushed RNG to the limit. So even if they don't pick up the win, this is a massive showing for the LJL region to be able to keep up with the, the fourth best team in the LPL. And not just for the LJL. Remember back during game one, that was the first time any minor region team had ever taken a game off of RNG. They were 18 and zero historically. So DFM definitely showed that RNG can bleed in a way that yeah. a minor region team has never shown before. But as you were saying, it's just been RNG ramping up throughout the series. And they're getting to the point now where this is the MSI champion squad. This exactly. is the team that people were expecting when they put that 93% vote in, it's calling RNG the win. It's also easy to forget, I know I forget this all the time, that the only team that they've lost to in best of fives is the reigning world champion. EDG are the only team that have beaten RNG in best of fives in summer. They lost two to EDG and, you know, we're able to make it here by taking down teams like LNG. So this is a very tough task, despite some of the struggles that RNG had, you know, in LPL coming into play and losing to DRX. So definitely no easy task that DFM was given. I mean, the only team that could take uh, RNG to all five games 
this year at MSI was T1, right? They, that was like, it's an impressive performance. So, I mean, all credit due to DFM. And as we say, this is a squad that has been together for so long, attracts so much of the talent from the LJL. It's incredible to see how they've continuously gone from strength to strength, keep coming back every single international tournament, oh. stronger than the last, and make teams like the LPL teams work for their money. Well, we've got the third Drake of the game dropping now as RNG have control over it. DFM, yeah, they know they're in a tough spot if you give them soul point, but you're in a worse spot if you all die trying to contest for it. So there it is. If RNG can get that last one, it will be soul at about 22 and a half minutes into the game. That's incredibly difficult to deal with. But when you consider the game itself being a 7K lead at 17 minutes, it sounds about par for the course. RNG have a death grip on this game and are not letting go. Exactly. That's why for DFM, I was going to say, you want them to kind of draw a, a line of neutral wards in the sand and just wait to scale up. The problem is, with the fact that they're already on soul point, there really is no time to scale. RNG now using the Herald to accelerate the game even further. And I mean, heck, I I'm curious to see how far this Herald push can go. I mean, a lot of times you see a Herald summoned up for like a first turret take and teams want to force it in to get the damage onto the tier two. This time around, it's forced damage onto the tier three. It'll have 25% health remaining. I guess if you're looking for a silver lining on that, at least the tier three turrets do regenerate health. So maybe it'll be able to heal back up over time. But time is a precious resource that DFM have not been given much of this game. And the thing is, even if you do try and buy that time, Breathe hasn't even hit his full strength either, right? Now you're looking at him potentially being able to aggress on onto a weakened tier three in the bot side rather than having to get through a tier one, a tier two, then to a tier three. So already RNG just in such a good spot and now Utapon is in trouble. Oh no, Ming went for the flash lick. However, Utapon does a good job getting away. He didn't even need to use a summoner spell on that one, maximizing the escape power and the self peel of the Tristana. Utapon will stay alive for now, but it still means control over the rift, control over the lanes, control over the vision for RNG. Looks like DFM is setting up for a pick, though. They could look in the mid lane and go, right, well, Utapon's backed away. We won't fully aggress on towards the turret, but trying to see if they can catch the reinforcements from RNG. Xiaohu, he's going to get flash, chain, CC, and he's dead before he's able to self ulti. Nicely done from DFM to find something there, but now they got to be careful and try to get away. Harp, he used the flash to make the play. He's got no way out. So it's traded one for one. I like the DFM go for it, and they don't even leave anything to chance. Like they're like, we're flashing in, we're using all of our ultis to make sure we get this pick. But RNG so fast on the trigger pull to react. I mean, had this pick back happened, you know, maybe 15 seconds later, maybe that could have even been a Baron. And I mean, that's a Lissandra who has ulti, has flash, and has stopwatch. If you don't all in and just completely floor it, she's gonna get away. It's taking she's 30 gonna minutes. live, and the tilt is gonna continue. So I'm glad that they went for it. Now let's see what Evan can do down here he sticks around trying to get this turret but it ain't gonna happen and now Ming has applied the pressure and breathe has applied the repost poor little Nar, you are not long for this world good night breathe gets his second kill it's a thumbs down for Evie unfortunately not quite able to get away from that one and now you've still got wave pushing topside push for uh, mid for Gal. I'm with two minutes now until the dragon with two smites available in RNG with Xiaohu having swapped his spellbook over to that as well. It's going to be so incredibly hard for DFM to try and contest it when they can't even get control on the map to push past River. No, incredibly rough. And, you know, 4RNG can keep just applying that sideline pressure with the Fiora. The thing now, though, is they don't have those TPs available, so it could be quite risky for them to over-index. I don't think RNG have a lot to be afraid of in terms of DFM going for any sort of crazy Baron sneak, like RNG might even be able to take a 4v5 with the amount of lead they have, but still can have to be on RNG's mind that they don't have that TP for Breathe. And RNG have a smooth sailing game ahead of them, barring any major malfunctions in the next couple of minutes. 75 seconds here on the Soul Drake for them. The Baron is already up. Very rarely in League of Legends do you just get to hard force Baron at 21 minutes if you want to, but Are you sure? RNG could uh, very easily do that here in this one. This LPL? Uh -oh, <laughs> Wait, do we do that all the time? Oh, boy, we do that all the I time. Feel like I'm failing the test. <laughs> that again. was like the top esports FPX special. <laughs> I feel like I'm failing the test again, my friends. But uh, it's DFM who are the most worried among all of us as Evie tries to get away from Breathe. The rest of RNG are just going to fall back a little bit. They're making sure they don't get caught out. Run, Evie, run. Run, Evie, run. 
Run, Evy, run! Run, Evy, run! I don't think he's gonna be able to no. run much further. Breathe's even gonna get the reduced cooldown there on the launch. Harp will go down first in the 4v4 back in mid as Breathe finishes the kill on Evy. RNG just ain't showing any signs of stop. No, they're just, again, running this game over, which feels like a good time to remind people that, I mean, if RNG win this, we already know what group they're going into in yep. the group stage. They're going into Group D. They're going to be playing with Gen G, Flying Oyster, and 100 Thieves. Gen G, a lot of people have them as the tournament favorite. So, you know, you do have that opponent, but also I'd say two other opponents that people would view RNG favorites over, 100 Thieves and CTC, CTBC Flying Oyster. So I feel like 4RNG should be feeling pretty good about this win and then heading into the group they're going. Man, there's the, there's the Soul Drake right there, uncontested. In the middle of nowhere, two dudes just beating the snot out of it. Look, DFM just don't believe in Drake violence any longer. <laughs> I do respect it, you know? They're I, repenting for their sins against the Drakes? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many Drakes there are in, you know, Rune Terra lore, but I'm assuming they're not infinite. Well, there's so. five of them. There were six, but he was BS and we had to get rid of it. <laughs> well, so. he's, coming, he's coming back, though. <laughs> he's coming well, back next year. That's in the future lore. This is, oh, wait, no, actually, there's six. I forgot the Elder. He's like the Super Drake. Guy. True. Uh, either way, there's not a whole lot of them. RNG is thinning the herd. They've already killed four this game. They've got the Mountain Soul at 23 minutes. Well, on top of an 8K gold direct lead, and now you can see him setting up around the Baron here. I would expect this to be the type of game where you get one Baron, you death ball it down whichever lane you prefer, and you end the game. Yeah, I don't even know if you need the Baron to be perfect. <laughs> it feels like <laughs> RNG are so incredibly far ahead, but they are set up here. They have Breed in the bot side. If anyone ever shows up to try and deal with Breathe on that bot side as well, that's just going to be the go button for RNG, and that's realistically all they're trying to achieve here is dragging DFM around the map, because honestly, even if it's Yaharong, I'm pretty sure Breathe 2v1's Evi and Yaharong right now. Oh, oh boy. Well, we might just out. be able to figure that out, my friend. Evi is about to die. Xiaohu killed Yaharong while he tried to teleport. They caught him, and that's both solo laners gone. And now it's just going to be the Baron for RNG. Breathe doesn't even have to come, so he can keep putting this split push pressure down in the bottom lane. And RNG still just winning out on both sides of the map. Unfortunate, because even though DFM are at this huge deficit, I thought, okay, well, if RNG kind of just mess about long enough, we do see items coming online for DFM's still amazing scaling comp. But uh, now with the Baron, it doesn't seem like we'll get to get there. Breathe is level 16, Harp is level 9. It almost takes two Harps to make a Breathe, and they do not want to go anywhere near this man. Breathe jumps in. Utapon going for a couple of auto attacks. Repost flies out as Harp goes for the flash. Stun, into the stun, into the gun, and there it is. But it's traded across the map for Steel. It's the stun gun one for one. Xiaohu even gets the top side as well here. It's all over for RNG, just picking up things right, left, and center. Even with one pick coming back, Breed still got Evi. They still got the Baron. And look, it's a nice little uh, bit of gold in the back pocket for the AD carrying Utapon, but not going to be enough. Now we're going to see, right, Utapon trying to go help and show us if they can win that 2v1. But Xiaohu and Wei say no. Get that pick, which leads to the Baron going over to the side of RNG. So let's see where things are right now. We got two minutes left on the Baron. We've still got Soul locked and loaded, running for everybody on the side of RNG. Breed has five seconds before he's back alive. Unfortunately for RNG, his death means that if they want to have full Baron split push power, somebody else has to be with Fiora, which is not what Fiora wants. She much prefers to just be out on her own, doing her own thing, moisturized in her lane, vibing. But that's not the case. RNG is going to continue moving through the enemy jungle. Bounce back and forth. Control the vision. Make it dark. Make it scary. And make it so DFM doesn't know where they can walk. Breed is back up on the top side. He has no TP. But I don't think RNG is really too concerned about that. 4v5. They've still got more gold in combat power. And that's why Breed TP top side. He wanted to make sure that he could actually get the push right as this bot wave is going to collapse as well. And you can see the Sejuani ult from Steel fired out there in desperation. Xiaohu was able to evade it as Evi goes in and finds a stun on the Wei. Oh, wow. Bakala's got the kill right back on to Evi. Yaharong's gonna die. Wei goes in again. Utapone barely escaping, using the cleanse, barely staying alive. Wei wants another one, but he won't get Steel. He will force both tanks of DFM back into their own base. 
back into their own fountain. And it's looking like the end of the series here as Xiao Hu will end up dying there at the very end. Utapone goes down as well, however, and that means that RNG is on to the Nexus. DFM tried their best, but RNG will take them down and punch their ticket to the main group stage. The MSI champions, you never doubted them getting through play-ins. So there were some hiccups, lost to DRX, lost to DFM in this series. But I think overall, going through play-ins, probably a good experience for RNG, figuring out their read on the meta. We even saw in this series scaling up to by far the most dominant game when they had. Yeah, and you can still see, though, it's a lot of bad for picks for RNG, right? The Diego coming through from way, looking great on that. Xiaohu, uh, sorry, Breathe looking great as well on things like the Fiora. It's still a lot of these things that we know and saw in the LPL. But, I mean, you can see there for Heavy, devastation for DFM. They tried their heart out to get themselves to groups, but unfortunately, they were up against the MSI champions. And it's the things most recent in memory that jump to the forefront of what we think of the series. But again, I do not want game one to be forgotten. I do not want the first time that RNG lost a game to a minor region, that RNG lost a game to the LJL representative to be forgotten. DFM have made strides as a team to elevate their own region, to bring that performance here to the world stage. Unfortunately for them, they will not be able to run it back this year to the group stage on that main stage yet again. But they fought like hell trying. I gotta commend them for what they did here today. But this will be their exit from Worlds 2022. One of the most, I mean, heck, the most dominant team to ever come out from the LJL. I mean, the, the crowd rightly applauding them yep. because they've had terrific games so far again. When it comes to macro, when it comes to team fighting later on in the game, they've shown they can contend with the best. Yeah, and I mean, look, RNG, unfortunately, were able to kind of come out of the gate swinging in game three and game four. But as you say, game one, they took the game. Game two was incredibly close. Yeah. It does show how much the appearances at these international stages have mattered for DFM, closing that gap yeah. bit by bit. And I mean, look, you can say that we expected RNG to get out of play-ins, but there was definitely yeah. a little bit of doubt that started to creep in there after that first two games. DFM made it a fun series there in those first couple of games like you're talking about. They were up against an absolute titan in RNG. As you've said so many times, the MSI champions, a team that has only yep. lost best of fives in summer to one other team. It's a tough ask and DFM fought as hard as they could but they will come up short and RNG will be the last play-ins team heading to the main group stage with that resolved let's send things over to the state farm analyst desk for the world's cool down thank you so much Lyric Dagda and Captain Flowers congratulations to RNG RNG as one of my friends would say what a fantastic game four from RNG, but what a disappointing or depressing end for DFM. It started so strong, they looked really good. Unfortunately for them, RNG were too strong once they got ramped up. Yeah, it's tough, but still important to recognize the growth that they had going into uh, plans and then finally realizing that in game one. Yeah. So it's at least, it's a bitter story, but at least it's a, it's a bittersweet one. It is a little bit bittersweet. I will say that we'll come back to wrap this series up and talk about the ramifications of the groups as well as make some predictions a little bit later. Before we get to that, while we're recording an interview with RNG, we thought we'd start at the top of the day with one of the uh, most historic best of fives ever at the World Championships and Chronicler, Evil Geniuses, smashing the Mad Lions. I was a Mad Lions, or a, rather an EG believer, and I thought that it would be a heartfelt match where in the end, EG's, uh, I think, individual level of play, far ahead of Mad, or ahead enough of Mad Lions to actually get in the win. Yeah. But that didn't happen at all. Uh, Alioya was kept down, and as it turned out, if Alioya didn't get going, that was the end of Mad. Yeah, we both thought it was going to be a five-game series, and really did. It really felt like. Evil Geniuses were constantly moving, finding picks, specifically lo looking towards bot side. Unforgiven and Kaiser were the targets a lot of the times in that one. And it was pretty rough. Felt like Jojo Pion was really on point today. Um, it looked like it was just a mid-jungle mid domination. I mean, it really was. This game too was really impressive as well. The Draven was locked in early. <laughs> and Ichi just said, yeah, and 
They ran the, the, the Super Yumi and they just dumpstered that late. Such a great performance. Yeah, in particular, I really love the set pick. I felt like that was a really smart one, recognizing that you're, they're going to throw the Silas mid and that they were going to find constant plays through mid lane that Silas really couldn't react to. Um, overall, a really great series for Evil Geniuses and just pure team fighting. Really a uh, performance as well. I mean, the set mid, you know, some of the great LCK mid laners like Chovy have been uh, have, have been known for playing champions oh, like I that as well. Oh, yeah, and BDD, that's this true. Was, this was very, uh, very set. Even uh, lesser known as Bay. Remember Bay in uh, yeah. MSI? He did it. <laughs> um, but, but what we're seeing, or what we saw here today from EG, I think, is a very clear sign that if you look to the first day of play-ins, this team did not look like this at all. And considering they're playing with Kauri, uh, that actually makes a ton of sense. One series, that, right? That, one series in the LCS. That really tracks. Yeah, it really does. I will tell you as well that while my analysts both predicted five game series, I predicted the 3 0 for Evil oh, Geniuses. I knew, oh, I had yeah, full confidence. Sure, sure you I did. knew sure. they were going to 3 0. I wow. have the video evidence to prove it. So I, I can't flip flop, but you can. I did. I did. I did it successfully. That's the difference, okay? Mm, okay. Um, now, that wasn't the only history that was made today because before we get to DFM versus RNG, I do want to take a moment to catch up with Law, who spoke to EG's bot laner, Kauri, after that 3 0 victory. Let's take a look. And we're back in Mexico for the Verizon post-game interview, and I'm joined right now by the victorious Kaori from Evil Geniuses. Thank you so much for joining me for this very first international interview. How does it feel to take down EU? And especially because it's the last time, it's the first time actually that someone does it internationally. I mean, it feels great. And like, I didn't have the chance to play with good teams before, mm -hmm. and I was on the bottom team. So it is really good for me to show myself on bigger stage and do what I can do, yes. Yeah. I'm really happy. I, I can imagine that you're happy, especially given all the circumstances around you being subbed in. Danny having to step out, you coming in during the playoffs, but also being aligned for the World Championship. Tell me how you reacted when EG told you, hey, you know what, you're going to be playing bot lane at Worlds. I mean, before Worlds, they said for semi-finals, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, can I play? Because like, I didn't take scream, I was on break, I don't know meta. I just played semi-finals without scrim and everyone is like flaming me, Lucian or tip or something. Because <laughs> like I don't have enough scrim. Now it feels great to make them wrong and like prove that I'm not Lucian or tip and I can play. <laughs> I can bring team positive things yeah. like they uh, like they did. It feels always nice to prove people wrong, uh, I guess. Are you okay? Yeah, okay, okay, okay. okay. Yes. Uh, I have just a couple more questions for you. Uh, tell me about this experience actually playing at Wells for the first time, as you said. Not enough, not a lot of time to train. Uh, but what did you learn so far playing here? I mean, uh, I'm learning that how to take pressure as a positive mm -hmm. and how to play on the stage better and how to be more aggressive like I am on the screams. Yeah. And yeah, that's like that. And I'm really enjoying the fun and the experience. So it is a learning too. And I, I bet the next stage is going to be cool as well. Being in the group B, facing the likes of G2, JDG, Damwon Kia. You were telling me before the interview that you, you've never played these teams, of course. You've yeah. just watched them play. How do you think it's going to come together when you actually face them on the rifts? What are your expectations here? I mean, PC can RNG sometimes and Dragonics and mm -hmm. GDG and other teams are like world finalists or they can win worlds easily. Like they are all of them so strong teams. So I am really excited to see what can I do with them. But I never had chance to play with them on stage or anything. So I don't know what is going to happen, but I will try my best to yeah. win with them. It's going to be a, a nice way to prove yourself, I guess. Any specific bot lane you want to face in particular? Jakey Love, but uh, I'm group. Jakey Love, okay, I'll keep an eye out on this matchup. Kari, thank you so much for the interview. Congrats on making it to the group stage. And back to you guys in LA. Thank you so much, Law. I will start by saying your hair looks absolutely stunning, darling. Boom. And I will also say that we've spoken to Evil Geniuses a lot throughout the course of the tournament. I think both of the games they lost during the group stage, we had losers interviews from the team. The games that we've had where they were victorious, they've come out. I think every single EG interview has been my favorite interview of the event. And even there, hearing from Kari, just talking about it, you know, I didn't scrim, was on break, wasn't playing the meta, came in for semifinals. And it was like, people were flaming me. It's really humanizing, it's really powerful to hear that. And then you see how he steps up over the course of a group stage. I mean, takeaways from the series, as well as the interview to wrap it up. I love that they talked a little bit of smack. I think it's it's very deserved after the performance that EG had, as mentioned. Uh, in historical 
fashion, this series was really, really big. Yeah. Uh, and I think EG's performance overall, they're a team that from a, from a, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an LCS enjoyer, but time zone wise, it's hard for me to follow. But you can follow the tweets and you can follow, <laughs> you can. Can follow the memes and you can follow True. that, right? And I actually think that that is something that um, we we haven't really had as much. I think the last team that really leaned into it was, of course, G2. Yeah. Um, and I think EG is kind of stepping into that same role. So I, I really like performance well. as well as play. Exactly. True. Hey. High engagement tweets, if it's engagement baiting, that always, that will last. <laughs> People will see that for sure. Uh, and just a, a small point too, calling out the fact that people are questioning his champion pool in particular, saying that he was an OTP yeah. and that he felt like he, he really wanted to prove that wrong. In Academy, he was like the guy that was playing Callista, Draven, like he was actually an, a really aggressive AD player. So like obviously being thrusted into a huge stage like Chicago and now Worlds, he's like, Need to get fat better quickly, and I mean, he feel like he's been doing that. Timeline is quite crazy. You think about it over the course of like eight weeks, Chicago and the, and, and the area here in New Mexico, Mexico City, correction as well. Like I mean, that's an intense yes. ramp up. Congratulations to Evil Geniuses. I will give the my uh, uh, the analyst desk best tweet of players. This isn't a thing that exists. To Kauri, when he said to uh, Armut, I'm the best Turkish player. There was an explosive in that, I won't say. Right, let's move on. Let's turn our attention to Dent Nation Focus Me, taking on Royal Never Give Up. At the beginning of the day, 18 and 0, RNG had never lost a game to a minor region. And this opening game from DFM made me believe they could do it. And that in of itself is a really big achievement. Uh, and I said at the top of the day, and I still truly believe that what DFM here, did here today was extremely impressive. Uh, you can look at, at RNG, who obviously grew a lot throughout the series. Uh, draft here was maybe not the best, but that would take away from the fact that uh, DFM earned that win. Everyone expected DFM to get 3-0, yeah. yeah. like, and have it be a complete storm. I don't think that's disingenuous, and they performed so much better than expected. And contrast this to day one. Where Abby went what one seven and two on Aatrox? That huge is a difference. couldn't be callback. Couldn't yeah. be more different. Yeah, huge difference between day one and now. And I felt like they for sure earned the win. A really, really uh, disciplined game one. A strong game two, of course, with one mistake. And I felt like it just get they teetered off a little bit, yeah. overthinking it perhaps. That will always happen. And I think it is also fair to say and fair to criticize that RNG were not their characteristic selves, I think, for those opening games. And there's twofold, right? On one hand, DFM took advantage of that. Yeah. They punished RNG. They were proactive. When you watch these replays, it's DFM setting up for the Drakes. It's DFM starting the fights. And ultimately, in game one, it was DFM winning those fights. 100%. The point that you made, that's that of them never losing to a minor region. The players know that, too. They may not say it or think it. It's in the back of their heads. And oftentimes, it will remind me of 2018 Invictus Gaming, where you will play to the level of your competition if you think that they're flatly worse. Yeah. And so it's a combination of detonation focus me playing really well in the first two games and a combination of RNG sleeping on them. So it was just nice to see what was a, a competitive series at the start. I mean, that replay right at the end, the Elder Dragon went down. For, for about three seconds, I wondered if RNG with the Elder Buff would be able to win the game. But crucially, when you look at this post-game breakdown graphic, I really want to draw everyone's attention to the 0 to 20 minute mark. Look at that goal difference. Look how close it was the fact that DFM were leading. It was true for game two as well. Yeah. And I have to give credit here to DFM again. And I will reiterate and double down on what Chronicle said. It's the first minor region to take a game of RNG. They did it their way. And we showed a graphic from an interview on the um, uh, LPL stream a little bit earlier today around how DFM was saying, if we can beat RNG, we're good enough to win worlds. So we're playing RNG with the intent of winning the world championship. We'll come back to round out the rest of the series in just a moment because while it may have taken a bit longer than we would have liked, RNG, they punched their final ticket to the group stage and Law caught up with the victorious super support, Ming. And we're back in Mexico for the Verizon post-game interview, the last one of the playing stage with Ming. Ni hao. thank you so much for joining me. Congrats on taking down DFM. It was expected, but the first game maybe was not. Can you talk me through what happened? 首先恭喜你們獲得比賽的一個勝利,可能說第一局來講吧,不是那麼的像就是說如意料一般,它整個賽博是比較的符合意料的,所以說你的對於第一局的看法是什麼樣子呢? 
呃，第一局的话，有一半自己也没睡醒的状态，然后还有就是自己因为四五的时候选人出现问题，加上 BP 的时候，我们做了一些有点意见不统一的情况，所以说导致那一把打出来的会效果会很乱。So I would say, uh, in terms of the game one, I was a little bit unawake. So, uh, yeah, I was that in that kind of condition. And as for the pick and ban phase, we had some, uh, mistakes or just uh the problems in communicating with the picks in four and fifth picks. So uh, that's kind of the miscommunication in the picking the pick and ban phase. That's probably the reason why we dropped the first game. All right. Well, you managed to adjust and wake up also for the next game. Uh, when I talked to Shahu last time, we talked about the memes around you and him being the mom and dad of RNG. So what happened after game one? Were you the angry parents or more the supportive parents or the rest of the team? 之前他在跟小虎选手的一个采访当中，其实他有提到，就是好像你跟小虎是扮演着队内的一个父母这样的一个角色，所以在输掉了第一局之后，那你们两个是更扮演的说比较比较愤怒的父母呢，还是说比较支持型的这样的一个父母角色呢？呃，其实第一局失利之后，我们下来的话是在讨论自己的不足，还有自己的问题。然后我跟小虎的话也在反省自己的问题嘛，因为其实我们打了这么多年了，也我觉得应该给新人一些。好的效果，所以说这种实力实力下来之后，我们就会说出哪里可以调整，哪里有问题，然后跟一起来，大家一起来调整。呃、uh, ，so for as for 呃、uh, after the dropping the first game, uh we were like just focusing on finding the problems and our individual mistakes in the game one, and because after so many playing as a pro player for so many years, me and Xiao who wanted to uh have some. Uh, effect like idle effect on our rookie players, so uh, we just wanted to find what we can adjust in the upcoming matchups. All right, supporting approach here then. Now focusing on group stage, Group D with Genji, Hundred Thieves, Flying Oyster Oysters. What are your first thoughts on playing these teams? 那你们进入到小组赛之后是进入到 D 组嘛？所以说你对这样的一个小组分配的是呃小组的分组情况是有什么样的期待呢？嗯、呃，就其实小组期待的话，就是三个队伍都是不同的风格，所以说很想跟他们交手。然后根据的话，就是实力特别厉害嘛，所以说就想跟他们挑战一下，到底有没有具备挑战他们的资格吧。Uh, so I would say the three teams in uh, the Group D, all of them are very strong teams, especially I would say Gen G, he, they're really, really uh, strong and good team. And I really want to say if uh, we are qualified to challenge them uh, uh, as a really strong team. And maybe it's extra special for you guys coming back as the MSI winners, but there's also the meme around RNG being the kings of spring. What do you think of that and how is it going to be different for you guys this time around? 其实这一次也是以一个 MSI 冠军的身份来进入到世界赛的嘛。那关于 RNG， 其实有一个可能说像小称号、小梗这样的这个说法，就是称之 RNG， 以及说可能世界赛的一个状态是比较起伏的。所以你的一个看法，包括说一个后面的一个期待是什么样子的呢？呃，其实有些时候前半段拿到 MSI 冠军的时候，然后中间更换版本的话，会导致我们自己的版本有一些时候是我们自己的个人能力问题，跟不上，所以说。这种情况会出现比较多，所以说才导致下半段的时候大家会打得这么艰难。然后所以说我们一直在弥补这个缺陷，然后也一直在改进，所以说在努力调整这些。So probably after spring there will be some changes around the meta, and definitely I would say, uh, uh, with the meta switches, uh, our individual abilities might be the problem, or we have some shortcomings in our individual abilities. So we are that's probably the reason why we had a very difficult, uh. Summer split after the spring split uh, after the spring split and the MSI. So definitely we will make on uh, make some adjustment on this and hopefully we can perform even better. Looking forward to seeing how strong RNG is going to be this time at Worlds, and also good luck to you, Ming, and good luck to RNG. Xie Xie for the interview, Iris. Thank you so much for the translation. And that's all for us here in the plane cell. We'll see you in New York. Back to you guys in LA. Thank you so much once again, Law, for another fantastic interview. And I think Ming. Um, fairly stern, fairly serious, like not, not not like uncomfortable or anything, but just that was a stoic, that was a serious guy talking about this, he's talking about the adaptation. I'm frankly a little bit surprised at yeah. how well DFM played. 100%. And just talking about the fact that needing to wake up, like you can talk about that either physically or literally just metaphorically, like, yeah. oh, we just need to wake up in this series and play a little better. But ultimately, I just love the answer to, hey, me and Shahu just, Focused on the adjustments in between. He's games. supportive. Yeah, yeah the, supportive. the supportive parent yes. is the one I'll go for in that. Yes. One. Right. That does it for play-ins. We do know groups. We do know all 16 teams that will be participating. And before I make these two gentlemen predict with placements, first, second, third, fourth, 
I want to round out what we have seen on the 2022 World Championship meta. I want to give you guys an update that during 2019, we saw the most unique champions we've seen at a Worlds before at 94. Right now, as it stands, we have seen 84 mm. unique picks. Any of the champion icons that you see that are grayed out, I believe that Nocturne and Pike might be the only two, if I, as far as I can see. Those are champions that have been banned, but not picked. Yes. Um, Chronicle, I'm going to come to you first. What do you make of this when you think that there are already 84 unique picks watched? I think it's really like, cool. Uh, I, I like the diversity a lot. I'm a little worried that it'll be a classic case where planes, there's a lot more experimentation, but as we get further into the tournament, it'll settle. And then we will kind of just pick the 20 champions that are the best. But I'm hoping that maybe we can break the record. And a lot of these teams just have deep team, like, you know, coaching staffs and everything. And I feel like the prep has been strong. Picks like the Tariq is something that pops out to me. And for me, another one that is not so much a prep pick, but I just love seeing it. And especially going into the group stage means a lot to me is Kalista. Because, man, we have so many talented AD carries. Ruler is going to be in this tournament. We, comp yep. from Rogue is going to be a strong one. Uh, I just feel like, oh, and even, you know, FBI from 100 Thieves uh, and Berserker. There are just so many yeah, You could literally just start can, listing, start listing, listing all yes, of them. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it, because there are so many strong ADs, because it defined the meta coming into Worlds. It was a bot lane meta. And sure, it wasn't a different pick. It was about hyper carries. But we have a lot of strong Callistas that we get to now see being played around. I have bad news. Oh. I, don't, I don't like being the bearer of bad news. I hate this already. I want to take you back to 2021. No. Evil Chronicler, stop it. I want to no. be the 2021. You know what the presence of Yumi was in <gasps> play-ins? 10%. You know what the presence of Yumi in groups was? 96. Mm. Um, I think it's going to happen again. I think that the nerfs were not enough. I don't know if engage reports are actually good enough. And uh, anyone besides Gen G, who have their uh, Lahens mad genius counter pick, um, is uh, probably just going to gonna suffer. As is everyone this. at home. I, I don't, I'm not saying I like it. I'm not saying you're that the one I'm bringing on it up with this. But I, I would be shocked if it doesn't happen just the same way that it did in 2021. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. No? Well, well, I hope you're right. Gentlemen, I hope I'm wrong. My, I, I do need to do a quick audio test. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear That's you. Working. I can hear you. I just really fine. hope everyone broadcast can hear me as well. Unfortunately, I've lost my in ear. So we're going to do this next segment <laughs> without any production crews and hope that this goes off well. Because before the EG versus Madline series today, I made a bet with Raz that whichever team lost. Their representative from the region would have to deliver a monologue. They would have to say goodbye to the team that lost. They would have to update the score on this monstrosity of a model. And then they would have to carry this thing to New York City. As I have lost the bet and I am a man of my word, I would like to say farewell to the Mad Lions. Now the Mad Lions this year have had a rough season. I'd like to take a look at some of the players on your screen. Remind everyone of Armut, Alyoya, Niski, Unforgiven, and Kaiser. I'd also like to remind you of their placements this season by looking at their pretty sad trophy case. Seventh in spring, didn't make playoffs. Second in summer looks great. Fourth in summer looks great. Unfortunately, they didn't win a BO5 to make it to Worlds. And when we take a look at their BO5s, and of course, that's it there. One and one when it comes to play-ins BO5. The truth is that this team wasn't even meant to be here. They were thrust onto the world stage and they had some tough times in EU. However, they had their moments. They weren't without excitement and energy. Take a look at some of these plays from the play-ins. Starting with Armut stepping up. The Gnarmut, he added the pink dino to his champion pool. Take a look as we turn our attention to the uh, rest of the Mad line, specifically Aljoya's Belver. Popping off, destroying faces, and frankly putting on his best star platinum impersonation with an order, 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 order for the ages. Now I do want to say goodbye to the Mad Lions. They put up a fight. Today they are the Sad Lions. Well, frankly, they've been the sad lines for most of 2022. Let's not beat around the bush about that. However, I do need to live up to the bet that was made. So if I can ask the cameraman to zoom in again on this thing 
as promised, I need to update this score. Now, if you have only just joined us, this is Jojo the Bald Eagle. And the way that this thing is gonna work, we're hopefully gonna carry it with us all the way around America until the world finals. And goodbye, Pen. Let's take a look at NA. I'll zoom this in here. You guys got one, two, and three. Well effing done. Thank you, Raz, it's worth a clap. What I will say, as I step down to the middle step, I do need to celebrate the evil geniuses. Aye, aye. Joe, 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 the 3 0 Canadian North American homegrown superstar popping off. Oh, we got both mooses looking off the waist. That's <laughs> awesome. Congratulations, Raz. I am a man of my word. I will now have to carry this thing to New York City, which is going to be an absolute nightmare. But what I will do is this if you guys can come over with me, Raz, come join me at the telescope. Let's do it. Chronicler, move over one seat. While I fix my audio, Chronicler and Raz, take a look at the groups. What I want to do is ask my analysts to predict for me first, second, third, fourth on two of these groups, right? And as they're explaining to you where the standings are going to line up, I want them to give their reasoning and their logic. Raz, I'm gonna fix my micro, my, my in-ear, you stop predictions and Chronicler help out. Perfect. I'm gonna start with group D. Um, I feel like this one is fairly easy. I'll go ahead and go for Gen G, first place. Great start, Raz. Doesn't really need an explanation. They're the best team right now in the world. I feel like they are just an incredibly strong uh, organization with a Chovy gap expected. I go into the second pick. It has to be RNG, actually. And it's funny because people will look at this series and feel like it's a bit of a meme, but they will organize, come back into this group stage and dominate. This one is going to be tough. People just love the title of the Flying Oysters, uh, but they were a really strong team. But I have to believe in 100 Thieves. I really have to. As good as Rest is and as good as Shun is in the bot side of the map, I feel like 100 Thieves should be able to carry it through with the strong mid jungle that they have in Abadaga and Closer and CFO at third. This one is the, this is the closest one. I feel like between CFO and 100 Thieves, that one's gonna be a really debated topic until we get to that group. And then I go to group A. I'm going to have to give it to T1 in first. My number ones are awful, by the way, as you can already tell, it looks like an I. And then I'll go in with EDG in second. Cloud9 fans already know. Jack already knows what I'm trying to do here. So, yes. Chronicler, Chronicler, do you have any challenges to this? I'm back, I can hear everything. Yes. Raz, take a look at the camera. Now, Chronicle, what's your thoughts on some of these picks and where you would challenge? Give me all my pen back. Here you go, here you go. So, so I lost my audio, so I think we trade a place. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be on You're gonna give us, okay, come good. On. Yeah, come on No, over. no, no, give me, give me these first before you do it. I want you to debate, this. I want okay. you to debate. Uh, I have nothing except I'd switch the oysters and 100 Thieves, which okay. is the thing A lot that of Raz people will be talking about Kind of on the fence about. Yes. Um, that'd be my only swap. That'll be on your swap. Yeah, okay. I'm not, not very controversial. People already know my prediction history yes. when it comes to C9. Yeah. And so for the European fans, any the global Listen, fans, Listen, you're a flip-flopper. You're the most well-known flip-flop on the planet. But I also cursed Cloud9, by what the way. I will the ask, entire time, I've cursed Cloud9, so I'm putting them third for a reason. I will ask production to yes. put myself and Rez back on camera, because I'm going to write your world championship prediction. Ooh. Okay. And when we do that, I want you to think about, give me your setup, right? Who is your world champion that you're locking in now that I swear and I promise I will quote, I will retweet, okay. and I will hold up for you. All right. For me... And tell the camera. The incomplete team with the talented players. For me, it reminds me of Samsung White that ends up winning Worlds, even though at the beginning of the tournament, Samsung Blue was the more organized team and had things right from the beginning. But the team that builds up, learns that the more talented player, I think will ultimately take it, Top Esports. You're going Top Esports. Because I think Top Esports has a lot to learn and they will have to be the team that scales up, but they have Jackie Love, they have Knight, they have Tien. They just have so many damn strong players that I think as they go along, they'll learn their lessons. Okay, well, we'll find out. Rez, please take a seat. Chronicler, you are now up. You don't need your in-ear for this. You can hear me loud and clear. Now, give, give me your predictions. Rez, sit on my seat closest so the camera has less time to travel. Sounds good to me. And let's start. Whichever group you want, and then I'll interject All right. to ask Rez some questions and give you some homework. So I'm going to start. This this is an easy one. This is, this is, a, this is a freebie. Okay. I have faith in the LPL number one seed. 
There might be an LPL team that collapses. I wouldn't be surprised. Please note, he's throwing down one under the bus. If it's, it's Raz's uh, pick for, <laughs> for the world's winner, it wouldn't be shocking. Uh, but I'm going to go with Damon Kia, number two. I think that the team should have a really great time within this meta uh, and looking at the performances of G2 at MSI. I don't think that they can stand up to either JDG or Damon Kia for EG, as much as I like them, as well as I uh, am looking forward to uh, Trevor carrying the bald eagle. Uh, Jojo. <laughs> Choose wisely. Uh, I don't think that uh, that's going to be enough. Choose wisely. So I will have EG Three and four. And EG on four. And next group? Next group. So this might be slightly more controversial. I'm gonna have Tess on one. Uh, even though I think they might collapse. The LCK caster is throwing LPL. Not... Uh, no, 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 no. Hold no, on, no. No, hold on. Rez, wow. can I already start? Number one, number one in both groups. Are you, like, this feasible? Do you, do you think... Do you... I think it's very feasible. Welcome to the team, Chronicler. I really appreciate that. What is this? Okay, the LCK... I don't know. I'm, not, okay, I'm, not, I'm not here. I'm, I'm, just don't worry. My world I'm getting word is... from Atlas right now. He's well, a shame. Hey, Atlas, Atlas can be happy because... There we go. All right, all there right. we go. This is, I think, uh, uh, as controversial as I get. I think that DRX shouldn't make it to quarters, but they will. They're going to. I don't know how. I don't know um, what happens between Rogue and, and Gam, but uh, Deft makes it to quarters. That's those are the rules. Okay. I don't. I don't make them up. Last year's Humble Life was uh, a much worse team, and they made it. So if they can do it, then I think uh, DRX can as well. Who's your three, four? That's that's a toughie. Um, and I am gonna go with Gam on three. Oh my, well, this is Whoa! nonsense. Whoa! This is nonsense. Yeah. I, 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 I don't... Justify the how. I don't, gut I don't... Yeah, I don't have a lot of faith. So you've just made it up. That's in what you're the saying. LEC. <laughs> That's um, insane! I really rate the... Uh, well, I think that this is... Listen, uh, one we've of had the one groups. team, one team that cannot make it out of players. That's it. And for that, you're throwing all my boys under the bus? Chronicler, where were you born? Okay, Pen. Yeah, Are you that, not European? Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I thought, am. I mean, I thought you were Danish. Oh, no! Eh? No, 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 oh, no, 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 no. Who is your world champion? Mr. Chronicler. So, I, I'll, I'll paint you the finals. Uh, the finals will be Damwon Kia versus Gen G, and Damwon Kia is going to get it. What? Wow. Yeah. Damwon Kia. Okay. Well, mine's simple. You're all wrong. Rogue are winning worlds. Oh, I my. don't know what, <laughs> what shape that is. <laughs> Even your marker is rebelling. It's rebelling. <laughs> the there said we go. No. That's meant to be Rogue. Wait, we need to put that there. <laughs> He okay. hated the idea so much. <laughs> they got <laughs> okay. rebelled. Right, let's go sit down. Come, let's sit down. Let's okay, round, well, let's round right, the well, let's show out. Let's round let's the show go. out. Um, I think let's just give closing thoughts now. Of course, as a <laughs> reminder, yeah, I, I obviously, I was the one that put that blue arrow yes, on the, the Telestrator. I obviously used the incorrect tool for that one. Um, I just want to get some closing thoughts now. Play-ins is concluded. I think Evil Genius is advancing through is one of the surprises. However, I wouldn't argue the like huge surprise. The yeah. way they qualified, way more surprising. Yes. RNG making it, I think, is what everybody anticipated. So I'm gonna get one last closing thought before I officially wrap up play-ins. We jump on a plane, fly to New York, and I carry that monster all the way there. Chronicler, close us out. What's your thoughts? Oh, that's a, that's a tough one. You uh, you want to hear my thoughts on, on my world's book or just some plays? I can do whatever. I had, a, I, had a, I had a wonderful time. I can't wait for groups because uh, I love planes for the story element of it. I think it's such a cool uh, element of, of of seeing these players that you might not know unless it's TFM because they've been the same team for a while now. Uh, coming from a region that in the grand scheme of things is very irrelevant in the Benelux. Uh, but groups when it comes to pure League of Legends always delivers. So I can't wait. We went through a roller coaster ride. A lot of stories came through. And it's like when you're reading through a pretty hefty book, and after all of it, it just says prologue. And you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> we still haven't even started yet? <laughs> That's what the group stage feels like to me. Uh, and there's just so many more teams to introduce. And I feel like this is going to be a world to remember. I certainly hope so. I, I really just want to say thank you to everybody watching at home. I want to give a particular shout out to every single North American as well as Canadian fan that is watching, playing, competing. Champions Q has been awesome. Evil Genius has absolutely demolished the Mad Lions. It is a good week to be a fan of the LCS. Now, don't let us down. Keep this up for Cloud9 and 100 Thieves. That's going to do it from us here on behalf of myself, the casters, and a broadcast team that is exceptionally happy behind the scenes today. Thank you so much for watching.
North America is greater than EU today. Ooh, he said today, it. He said it. Today. Clip it out. Good night. Clip we'll it see today you in a couple out. days for more worlds. Mwah. We love you. Goodbye.